Hey, it's Jared with Gear and Light. Today, we're going to talk about video settings for your DJI Mini 3 Pro. Now, these settings are going to work whether you are on the Pro Controller or the mobile app. And we're going to walk through camera settings that are going to give you better overall control over your video and the video quality that you're capturing so that you could produce better content out of your DJI Mini 3 Pro. So I'm going to go ahead and get my Mini 3 Pro powered up. Uh, this Mini 3 Pro tends to over heat when it's been sitting for too long so there might be a few instances where I have to start and stop the video uh, so bear with me as I do my best to get through this these settings I have found to produce the best quality image out of your DJI Mini 3 Pro it produces fantastic quality uh, images and video but you do need to know some of these controls because it is a small sensor and small sensors need our help to get the best quality image so I've got it powered up the first thing that I am going to do, you can see I'm already in pro mode, but most of you may be in automatic mode. Uh, and you can see I've got some settings right here. I've got my storage, my resolution frame rate, and my exposure compensation. And you can see how that is looking right here. If I go into pro mode, I'm given some different settings. And I can access the first one we're going to look at, whether you are in automatic mode or you are in pro mode. So we'll tap on resolution. You can see here I've got 4K and 24 frames per second. You've probably been wondering what that HQ means, and we'll talk about that here in a second. Now, I always shoot in 4K because I want the highest resolution that this camera can produce, and 4K is the highest that it will go. You can also shoot in 2.7K and 1080p, but aside from smaller file sizes, there isn't really any benefit to shooting lower resolution. Now, shooting in 4K means that if you're going to produce a 1080p video, you have a lot of, of uh, real estate to work with that you've been capturing. 4K can be either compressed down to 1080p, and it kind of improves the image quality when you take all those pixels and squish them down, but also you can crop in significantly uh, in, into 4K if you have 4K cropping down to 1080p. So that acts kind of like having a zoom lens, being able to crop in. If you have a higher resolution image cropping in, you can have the effect of having had a, a much closer looking shot without getting closer physically with the drone. So higher resolution typically is better. The only reason you wouldn't want to shoot higher resolution is if you don't want the big file sizes. So let's talk about frame rate. There's a lot more to talk about when it comes to frame rate. And you can see that the first three frame rates are HQ for high quality, and then the last three frame rates don't have that. The actual recording capabilities of this drone will capture a higher bit rate at these lower frame rates. Now that's a little confusing, so let me briefly explain it. 24 frames per second means that it's capturing 24 frames for every second of video captured. And as we increase that, so do the amount of frames that the camera is capturing. Now the bit rate is the file size, or essentially the amount of data within each of those frames. And this camera or this recording system can only capture such a frame rate. It can't go extremely high. And so going beyond 30 frames per second, it steps down to a lower bit rate, meaning you're getting a lower quality of image. And so I tend to only shoot at 24 frames per second unless I have a need to slow my footage down. And what I mean by that is that my projects that I'm editing in would be 24 frames per second. And if I put a 60 frame per second video file in there, I could slow it down and essentially create slow motion footage out of it. Now, 60 frames per second doesn't allow you to slow things down too much. You really get about 2.5 times the slowdown that you would get uh, because of 24 frames per second times two or times three, it's kind of somewhere smack dab in the middle. And so being able to slow your footage down two and a half times is cool but you don't always need it. And so I shoot in 24 frames per second unless I know that I'm gonna to wanna to slow down that shot. So there's really no need to shoot at 60 frames per second all the time because first of all, you're getting more frames than you would need. And so when you go and put that 60 frame per second a video file on a 24 frames per second timeline and you don't do anything with it other than just leave it there, you don't stretch it out for slow motion or whatever, it's cramming all those 60 frames per second down into 24 frames per second and the video image is looking a bit sharper and it doesn't have that fluid motion blur that you typically would get out of a 24 frame per second image. So 24 frames per second best matches what our eyes can see. It's the reason that uh, cinematic uh, shots are captured in 
24 frames per second. Most movies are 24 frames per second. And uh, it's the reason why television shows that are closer to 30 frames per second feel slightly different than a cinematic movie. Um, of course, there are a lot of television shows that are more cinematic these days, and so they're 24 frames per second. So 24p and 4k are those settings that I keep for the resolution and for the frame rate, unless I need to slow things down. Now, those are really the only settings except for exposure compensation, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, that you can change when you're in automatic mode. Pro mode is gonna give you a lot more settings that you can manually control. And here's where I would use pro mode versus automatic mode. Pro mode I use when my environment is fairly consistent. There isn't a lot of changes in light. There, the sun isn't going in and out of clouds every two seconds or anything like that. Um, and I want to be able to control the settings of my shot. When I'm unable to control my environment, I'm flying in and out of, uh, from maybe around trees and back into open area where the exposure is going to change. Obviously underneath trees, it's gonna be very uh, dark in comparison to an open sky. Um, I may just leave it in automatic mode because automatic mode is gonna do a better job of handling those variations of, in exposure than pro mode is. You'll notice that if I'm in pro mode, and I'm switching my exposure, it steps. You can see that the quality uh, or that the exposure is stepping as I change these. And even as, even as I slide this around, it does nothing until I commit to one and then it jumps to that. And so there's no smooth way of changing your exposure manually on a drone like this. And so you kind of just have to choose an exposure and go with it. Now, why would you manually choose a shutter speed? Your shutter speed is how long the sensor is exposed to light. In photography, the shutter opens and the sensor is exposed to light for a certain period of time, and that is your shutter speed. The faster the shutter opens and closes, the sharper the image is gonna be, the slower it opens and closes, the more motion blur is gonna be captured. And so in thinking about cinematic and that motion blur that we want with 24 frames per second, we don't want our shutter speed to be too high. We want our shutter speed to be low enough to capture that nice motion blur, uh, but obviously we want our image to be exposed properly as well. So there's a lot to think about there. Um, your shutter speed needs to also be two times what your frame rate is. So our frame rate's 24 frames per second. That means that our shutter speed needs to be 1 50th of a second because this drone doesn't offer 1 48th of a second. That would be exactly two times the frame rate. If we go below that, then we start to see issues with uh, the motion blur and all of that stuff. We can't go below that. And if we were shooting, say we were shooting at 60 frames per second, we would then need to set our shutter speed to 1 1 20th of a second to make sure that our shutter speed is two times the frame rate. And if we go below that, then we have issues. And so you want to make sure that your shutter speed is at least two times the frame rate. Now, in shooting outside on a nice sunny day, there's no way you're going to be able to shoot at 1 50th of a second unless you have an ND filter on your camera. You're going to have to minimize the amount of light hitting that shutter somehow. If I was to go out with no ND filter on my drone on a nice sunny day, I would probably be shooting my shutter speed somewhere up around 1 3,200th of a second. Now, the problem there is that that shutter speed is creating an image that is going to be very sharp and it's not gonna have that natural motion blur because the shutter speed is so fast that it's not allowing for any of that motion blur. The longer the sensor is exposed to light, the more happens as that shutter is opened and the sensor is getting a little bit of natural blur in there, just like our eyes see and just like what they do in the movies. And so in order for me to shoot outside with a uh, slower shutter speed, 1 50th, even as low as 1 100th, I'm going to have to put an ND filter on my camera. I've got a link down below to the ND filters that I use. On a bright sunny day, I'm usually shooting with a 32 ND or even a 64 ND. In evenings or early mornings, I'm probably shooting with an ND8 to ND16 so that I can get that shutter speed down as low as possible. So shutter speed is the length of time that the sensor is exposed to light, and we wanna make sure that that sensor get exposed to enough light that we have a good amount of motion blur so our image looks good and it doesn't look super sharp and kind of unrealistic. 
the next thing we're going to talk about is ISO. ISO is the sensitivity of the sensor. And so when the shutter speed opens, how sensitive is the sensor to the light that it's seeing? With a small sensor like this, we want this to be as low as possible. I try my hardest not to go above 400. Anything above 400 is going to produce noise and artifacting into your image that is really hard to remove. And so that is because the sensor is being boosted beyond its natural capability. And so noise is taking place. And I try to keep I try to keep it 200 or, or even at 100. If I can keep it at 100 all the time, which is the lowest, perfect. I don't want to go any higher than that. If I have to go to 200, I'm fine. Sometimes I'll go to 400 if I have to get the shot and it's the only thing that I can do. And I will never go up to 1600 unless I'm okay with that shot looking horrible because it's going to be super noisy. You might even be able to see the noise and all the stuff bouncing around in this image being up at 1600. So I try to keep this as low as possible. Now, you probably are noticing this meter right here that says negative three. And as I make changes to it, this adjusts and changes as well. This meter is there to help you properly expose your image. And it's super useful. For me, when I'm out flying, I want to try to keep my shot not zeroed out perfectly because I found that a zeroed out shot tends to be a little bit overexposed for me. I want the sky to be nice, blue, and vibrant. And on a smaller sensor camera like this, it is trickier to get more color out of something that's overexposed than it is something that's underexposed. So I would rather have something be slightly underexposed and then I can boost the exposure in the video editor that I'm using instead of trying to get it as close to perfect in the camera. It's not going to be possible uh, to get it perfect because that camera is up in the air and there's so much that it's capturing. Something is going to be either underexposed or overexposed. So I tend to go around negative 1.0. Um, so what that would look like in this scene right here is 1 50th of a second, which is the slowest shutter speed I would want to go and an ISO of 200. And of course I have just the standard uh, filter on this camera. No ND filter in here right now. Now, if I'm shooting in automatic mode, obviously automatic mode is going to try and get my exposure zeroed out, but you can go into the exposure compensation and set that to a minus as well. And so I usually go and set it to minus 1.0 because I don't want this camera to try and overexpose the sky. I want the sky to look really good. I want it to be nice and vibrant and have its natural color. And I do not want it to be blown out or I don't want there to be color lost. And uh, so sometimes I might be at 0.7. If I feel like minus 1.0 is too underexposed, I might go to minus uh, 0.7, usually minus 0.3, 0.0 is too overexposed for me. I want to bring it down a little bit because there's going to be something in my scene that's overexposed and it's hard to bring back detail in an overexposed area. It's easier to bring back detail in an underexposed area with a sensor this small. So exposure compensation, the EV here in automatic mode or when you're in pro mode, changing your settings so that your meter shows a little bit lower than zeroed out. Uh, and a lot of this is going to be trial and error for you. Take your drone up and fly, maybe shoot at zero, shoot at minus 1.0, and then bring that back into your video editor and look at it and see what looks good for you as you make changes to the exposure and, and changes to the scene that you captured, what ends up looking best for you. This is kind of a personal preference type of setting here. Next, we're going to look at white balance. Now, the white balance is accessible here, and I can tap on white balance and and set it to automatic mode or go and take that out and put it into manual mode. Now, the white balance is essentially changing the color of your image. And as you're flying around, the white balance is going to be changing based on how warm the environment is, uh, whether you're closer to direct sunlight and the sun hitting things or away from it, that's going to change. If you're underneath trees or if there's a cloud layer, that's going to change your white balance. And so white balance is a tricky thing. But what I don't like is color shift in my image. When I'm flying my drone around and if it's in automatic mode, uh, that is changing and color shifting 
over time. And so it's going to do its best to try and make it consistent. But I've noticed that when I'm flying around and I'm doing any sort of turns and there's sun out and the sun is exposing things in different ways because of the angle of the light, the color is starting to shift. And if I want something consistent, I'm going to have to go into manual here with my white balance. And that can be kind of tricky because we don't necessarily know how to white balance for the sky. It's easier to white balance to something close to us on the ground. So what I tend to go with is known values. I know that on a bright sunny day with no clouds, 5600 is daylight. I know that if there are some clouds, it may be a good overcast layer, that I'm going to have to bring that number down. And I tend to just look at the screen and give myself something that looks the closest. Um, if I'm shooting with other cameras, I will just choose to match my white balance to all the cameras. So that way I'm getting the same white balance values on all of my cameras. It's not going to be very easy to color correct your footage later out of a drone like this because it's not the highest quality footage and color correcting it is going to be a bit tricky. So you want to make sure, especially if you're shooting with other cameras, that your white balance is matched as best to the other cameras that you are shooting with. So if you're using other GoPros, if you're using other cameras, go into the white balance and set it accordingly so that they're all matched. Um, if white balance is a bit much for you to think about, automatic mode is just fine. Just know that there's going to be some color shift. And if there's noticeable color shift, this is where it's coming from. All right, so in this menu, there are some other settings here, but we're going to look at those settings from the camera menu. Of course, you can access these settings from here or this menu that we just looked at down here. There's some of the settings there. So uh, we're going to go into the camera menu here. You can see we've got video format of MP4 and MOV. Now, MOV is going to be a higher quality image than the MP4, but the MP4 is going to be a bit more widely accepted across all different platforms. If you try to take a uh, MP4 image and uh, load it onto your phone or anything else, you're going to be just fine. If you take an MOV file and try to load it onto your phone, it might not play. If you load it onto a Windows computer, it might not play, but it will work in a video editor. And so if you take that video file, whether it's an MOV or an MP4 into Premiere Pro, Final Cut Pro, DaVinci Resolve, whatever editing software you're using, you should be just fine there. Now under color, there's normal and decent alike. Normal is just the basic normal profile and decent alike is uh, kind of more cinematic look. It adds a little bit more contrast and kind of emphasizes some colors a little bit. And I tend to like the decent alike format uh, out of the drone like this as opposed to normal. Now, a lot of cameras have the ability to shoot in a log format, which strips out all of that processing altogether and allows you to do that in post-production, but a drone like this doesn't have that option. So it's not an option with this drone. Next is the encoding format. There's H.264 and H.265. H.265 is newer, and depending on what kind of computer, if it's an older one or older software that you're using, it might not support H.265. But I prefer H.265 because it's a little bit more streamlined of a format and it uh, usually produces smaller file sizes while still having great image quality. And so I use H.265. Now down under histogram, a histogram being turned on will show you a histogram down here, which is going to help you understand if an area of your image is too dark or too bright. The histogram will be pushed all the way over to the left if the values are totally blown out in the darks. And so as the image is too dark, so for example, if I increase my shutter speed, which is going to darken my image, you can see the histogram start to really push up over to the left. If I overexpose my image and slide things over, you can see that I start to get a histogram more shifted over to the right, and that would show me that I've got things too overexposed. And so you can use the histogram to give yourself an idea of how properly exposed your image is. And the more you know about histograms through experience, the more useful that's going to be. And usually you can use the histogram along with just looking at your scene. And that way you can understand whether or not you have it properly exposed. Using just the scene and no histogram or using only the histogram and not the scene definitely doesn't give you enough to really know. And that histogram is so small in the first place. It's basically, uh, you know, just to just to let you know that things aren't uh, totally blown out. And of course, you can move it around and I could tap on the X to minimize it and get rid of it.
and uh, till I go turn it back on again. Now I'll also also turn on grid lines. I like the um, the split grid like this that shows me the uh, nine quadrants. And so being able to do this, uh, the rule of thirds here allows me to position subjects within the frame. And I like to have that turned on. Uh, sometimes that just makes it a little bit easier for me to frame things up as I'm flying the drone around and thinking about a lot of other things. So those are the camera settings. There aren't a whole lot of camera settings on this drone, but as long as you have them set consistently, you're gonna get a consistent outcome. Now let's talk about a couple of extra tips here. First of all, with a small sensor like this, you're going to want to avoid shooting with the sun being in your frame. If the sun is in your frame, it's really going to affect the overall image quality. First of all, you're gonna have flares from the sun showing up. You're probably also gonna have color flare, color shift flares that are happening um, just because of the nature of this lens. And overall, it's just not gonna look good unless for some reason that's the look that you're going for. So I avoid keeping the sun anywhere in in my frame and try to fly with the sun being outside of the view of the camera lens itself, which sometimes can get tricky and is sometimes unavoidable, but it's just a tip that I try to follow so that I don't get weird things happening. Um, this lens tends to have a lot of flaring, and so as the sun comes in and hits the lens at an angle, you get those color spots and different flare things happening. Um, I know that's a technical term, flare things happening on the lens, and it just, it, it's sometimes kind of an, is annoying. It takes you out of what you're trying to experience and enjoy when looking at the drone footage. The next thing is an ND filter. I talked about ND filters earlier. In order to shoot in manual camera settings and be able to go with your shutter speed down to a reasonable shutter speed, you're going to have to put an ND filter on here. I am really surprised that DJI did not include ND filters with their Fly More kit like they did with uh, some of the other models, some of the higher end models but the Fly More kit does not come with ND filters. I've got a link down in the description below to the ND filters that I use. Uh, they're great and I will use anything from an ND8 on up to an ND64 on super bright days. Um, very good to have ND filters if you're going to get uh, the best footage possible out of your drone. The other thing that I do is I always format my card uh, in the drone. I have a micro SD card in the drone as well as there is the 1.25 gigabytes of storage built into the drone itself, but I like having a lot more storage so I use a micro SD card and I always format that micro SD card in the camera to prevent any issues. And so we've got the SD card right here. It shows how much space is there and there's the format button. Now, if I use my SD card in other cameras and perhaps it was last formatted in a GoPro, uh, it's not formatted by DJI and their file platform, which could be slightly different, usually is not a problem, but I don't like having corrupt video files. And so I always start out a session making sure that my SD card was backed up. And then once I put it in this drone, I format it. And I always keep my SD cards separate from my drones, from my D or from my GoPro cameras and all that stuff so that I am forced to go through this process of formatting cards and making sure that they are fully backed up before I utilize them. I've lost files in the past by accidentally formatting cards that weren't ready to be formatted. So if you follow that process of always taking your card out getting your stuff backed up, and then putting it in an SD card holder, which I've got a link down in the description below to the one that I use, then you know that that card is ready to go back in your drone and be formatted before you go out and fly. Now, uh, the last tip I'm gonna give you, if you have the Fly More kit, don't store your batteries in the multi-charger. So the multi-charger allows you to charge three batteries in a row. And I learned the hard way, if you leave all of your batteries in that and store them in the case, then they discharge each other and you have dead batteries. Now, I don't know if there's a workaround there or some way to prevent that, but I wasn't able to prevent it based on using the power button on the, the case or whatever. The only way I was able to keep my batteries charged is to take them out of that case altogether and put them in the Fly More case that I have that came with the Fly More kit. So I recommend not storing your batteries in that charging case 
um, even though it's super convenient. So that's gonna do it for my video on camera settings, video camera settings specifically for the DJI Mini 3 Pro. This is a fun little drone and I've got some other videos uh, that you should definitely check out if you're thinking about making money from your DJI Mini 3 Pro. I've got a video with 10 ways that you can make some money with your drone. I've got uh, a, a photo settings video coming out soon. And then I have a getting started guide coming out soon also for the Mini 3 Pro. So make sure to subscribe to the channel here on gear and lights so you get updates when I put out new videos if uh, that isn't enough and you want updates directly from me there's a link down in the description to the gear and light newsletter I'll make sure to send out an email to you when we have new videos come out it's not very often that I send an email out maybe once or twice a month but you'll get an email with the latest videos and latest resources that I've come up with to share and sometimes that is what we need in order to get updates is a nice email from a friendly face like this one so that's gonna do it for this video. Thanks for being with me today and I hope to see you back in another one soon. Take care.